over to the panel of conversation called Storytelling Around the Welcome Table Storytelling Friendship. Um, this is this is a panel that uh, I've been doing for several years. So I'm finally able to get something to get a conversation together for people who were both in town hall. Actually, everyone's been in town hall. Um, and let me tell you, let me tell you who we've been talking to today. Today we have Luke Kingmont. Who is a local sculptor whose family comes from Florida and from Greece? They're working in marble and stone to come to take their decision. He studied architecture, traveled the world, and then set up a temple in the Bahamas where he enjoyed a collegial relationship with the Bahamas. Let me tell you a little bit more about Luke. Um, when I first came to the village, uh, Luke was a tremendous supporter. Um, he was one of the few. Uh, people and uh, merchants, commerçants, uh, artisans, people doing business in the village who were unafraid to affiliate themselves with the work that we were doing, uh, even though it's going against the mayor. Um, it was, uh, it was a Luke even came to visit when I was squatting. Did you see how it's in On the middle of the squat one evening, dark, pitch dark. I hear noise out front, and uh, there are people peering in. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> it was that. It turned out to be. And, uh, and the, um, the friends across the way, the four of them, they put that out I got to say, y'all were a little, little bit tipsy. <laughs> and uh, we had this great little moment in uh, the house. Wonderful solidarity. I also had to steal the golf for a while. Stuff going on in other towns. Let me tell you what Florence left. Florence left is a fiction writer, social critic, and psychologist. Her novel, Sarah's Song, received the 1997 Literary Award for Fiction from the American Library Association of Black Caucus. She has served as the Dean of Students at Loveland College, a research consultant at the Institute of International Education's South African Education Program, as a liaison to the United Nations at Oxfam America, and director of the Bunton Institute at Radcliffe College. She first met Jane Baldwin in several and maintained a fast friendship. Florence also has been a tremendous support of the project. Years ago, we started sending little notes. I go to Florence Lab, and I go to Florence. A friend of Zach Obey. Hi, Zach. Uh, Zach is a visual artist who works in sculpture, painting, film, and photography. His work, which has been exhibited in institutions around the world, including the British Museum and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, draws on his upbringing in London and Trinidad, as it in, is informed by the history and lore carried through the African diaspora to the Caribbean, Britain, and beyond, with particular focus on traditions of masking and masquerading as a tool of self emancipation. Obey knew Baldwin growing up as a close family friend to his father. British filmmaker Horace O'Day. His current show at his Buck Gallery in Central Provence is called The Evidence of Things Not Seen and brings together new paintings inspired by the life of Jim Salt. So let's start with uh, maybe a little, a little story. Uh, Eric? Yeah. Uh, Eric? Eric will uh, talk to you. So, Luke, your relationship with James Baldwin was friendly, collegial. Luke is one of the few people, I have to say, in some Paul who is um, modest about his friendship. He doesn't. He never exaggerates his relationship with James Baldwin. They were collegial. They knew one another. So, I'd like to hear the story. <laughs> okay, so if you could start by telling us a story of your of a time that you were with Jimmy, something that you remember about him in Detroit. <laughs> 
the child of a faculty member, a postman, and invited me to a party where there would be a special guest. Um, the special guest was James Bond, the young man, and he looked to be about 14 at the time, was David Leamy, who became Baldwin's secretary, then his archivist, and finally his biographer. Mm -hmm. And it was over a period of a quarter of a century that I saw James Baldwin, often uh, in the company of David Leamy, in, uh, well, in his summer for a semester or more, uh, then in, this, in New York, in Boston, and finally uh, in 1987, I was here, uh, and I won't go into how I happened to be here, but in any case, I was here, and um, visited Jimmy in uh, June of 1987, but his health was on decline. Uh, he was not interested in celebrating himself at the time. And uh, I pointed out that he was to have a birthday in August and that he should have a party. And in fact, we put together a bit of a list <coughs> Um, and I came again uh, from Burgundy, where I now live, um, for his party, his birthday party on August 2nd, 1987, which is the last time I saw him. It was his last birthday. It was a small event. Um, Bobby Short, I think, was the only other big character. Um, in any case, that's my connection to Jimmy in St. Paul de Vance. But certainly, uh, I had occasions to see him in many other places. In Istanbul, uh, he was an occasional lecturer at a class in uh, the English department, and he uh, needed rides to the campus. Uh, I was living in downtown Istanbul, near Taxi if you know Istanbul, and uh, Robert College is in Bebek, which is up the Bosphorus. Um, and I would, and he lived sort of in between. He was at the time staying at the home of Engen Jesa and his wife. Um, and I picked him, I would pick him up for the ride to the college. Uh, I'd often find him at breakfast, uh, a breakfast of traditional Turkish beyaz uh, pinya, uh, feta cheese, uh, black olives, uh, something like uh, uh, creme fraiche, and caviar. <laughs> <laughs> and he lingered over that breakfast, and I often thought we were going to be late to school. <laughs> He trusted my driving, uh, and uh, we got the down to the campus certainly uh, within a few minutes after class time. <laughs> uh, he was spontaneous. He was the most eloquent extemporaneous speaker I have ever heard. Uh, and during those drives, uh, I guess in preparation for some of his talks, he, he talked about Conrad, uh, he talked about contemporary authors, also his contemporaries, uh, Mailer, uh, Roth. Uh, and I'm trying, well, in, in any case, uh, it was a range of literary figures who, uh, populated our conversations. Uh, in the evenings, and the expatriate community of Istanbul was uh, a serious party-going 
uh, <laughs> and um, J Jimmy came with his entourage, uh, and there always seemed to be uh, a group of young people, mostly young men, uh, two or three, uh, who accompanied him. And certainly David, David Leamy was there, and was there uh, intentionally as, as a witness to uh, Baldwin's early years. Uh, in retrospect, I wish I had been paying more attention. Uh, in retrospect, I wish I had thought of being his secretary. <laughs> <laughs> in, any, in any case, um, he frequently came almost weekly, once a week, for dinner. It was either a Tuesday night or Wednesday night. Uh, David accompanied him. Sometimes David Baldwin was with him. Sometimes Lucienne was with him. At least uh, on two occasions, I remember Lucienne to be there. And the conversations ranged from, well, the serious matters were about politics. And the social climate of the United States, the political climate of the United States, which in, engaged him deeply. Um, and then there was Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> in Istanbul, he was working on blues for Mr. Chuck. And he asked my then husband and me to be the first readers of the draft. Uh, to read for fidelity in terms of language and tone and reference to uh, the United States. My then husband was a Fulbright teacher and we were in Turkey for two years uh, and very much in touch with what was going on in the United States. We were there from 61 to 63. And it was in 63 when Jimmy returned, returned to take a prominent role in the March on Washington and uh, had more visibility then as, as a political activist. Uh, and it's part of his work, his work at that time. What more, Shannon? What more? What Um, we're going to talk for a few minutes. Can you, uh, what Eric? Eric, yeah, oh, he's doing double duty now. He's tech guy and he's the interpreter. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, question for me. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what about the importance of James Baldwin, you know, the loss of his legacy here in Sunday? What, what does that mean to Sunday? <laughs> Le seul personnage qui s'était créé dans le village avec une personnalité très très très, très forte. Right. Uh, so he's one of the only people in the village who had a really strong uh, personality. Le personnage de Prévert, de poète, de poète, de grands acteurs. He brought a lot of poets and actors, uh, people who were of great renown. Je suis un fighter en place. And since then, there's been nobody like that in, in the town, except for Plus. The culture of the village has really gone down since then and become more mass tourism. That's me, not him. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think you see it first, Dad. Okay. Cool. 
des artistes et des individus de centre de création. It's still a lot of artists, but a lot of artists who don't have a sense of creation or creativity. So it's a, it's a town that's going to be built upon, upon a very guilty the, the kind of great personalities in this uh, in this period that there really aren't anymore not in the town. They were pure, they were whole. So now it's all fabricated, it's uh, made quickly for quality. And the rapport that people had between each other was simple and natural. And we're very, uh, very uh, creative. Just another time, another time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is that the right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, hello, Zach. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Great. We can hear you. Would you like to start us off with a little bit of a reminiscence conversation about your time with James Baldwin? Yeah, I mean, I knew Jimmy as a kid growing up with my father in London. Uh, it began very early on in my childhood because Horace, my father, and Jimmy had worked together on the film Baldwin's Nigger in 1969, which was the coming together of Jimmy and Dick Gregory to discuss black politics of the day with an African-Caribbean crowd at the Caribbean um, Student Center in Labrick Grove. They remained friends intimately from then right through until Jimmy's death in the mid eighties. And Jimmy frequented the house often. And because of that, I had a very unique relationship with him as a child, a kind of uncle figure at home. And I, you know, throughout that period, he was an incredible man and very inspiring. Um, unlike many people that have searched him out through literature, it was interesting to, to discover him through a family network and, and, and the home in that sense. Um, our house was used often for political debate and such forth. Um, and kind of in the style of that time, it was very much a salon for meetings uh, with other artists, with writers, etc. cetera. Um, Jimmy and Horace went on to try and develop funding for Giovanni's Room. They were in discussion about numerous other projects at that point in time. My father was also working with Max Roach, trying to develop a script for the Charlie Parker story. Um, and it was an interesting time just in general. But I think Jimmy stood out as a giant, always amongst the crowd in terms of his disposition, uh, his, 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 uh, I guess his sense of accomplishment that gave him a sense of detachment in a way from, uh, I guess kind of the insular pains that a lot of uh, other activists were going through due to their situations. He always seemed to uh, be very involved in that sense um, and very charismatic. I mean, the thing I always took from Jimmy is, was his aspiration for my generation really to aspire to be, to be bigger and to grow beyond the boxes by which we'd been defined uh, in the Caribbean in Britain and across Europe uh, and to push oneself really to, 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 to that margin. Um, so that was kind of what I took from Jimmy as a child growing up. And uh, that's really been the main set of what I've been trying to put back into this work in the show. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jimmy, can you tell us a little bit about the show and uh, the inspiration? Well, I, for me, um, the inspiration comes from, I guess, Jimmy's questioning uh, of the black condition and the black experience globally, how one then uses those titles as a lens to look at subjects that are otherwise neglected, uh, historically, culturally, uh, in terms of injustices and equalities that we're still searching out. I thought long and hard about conversations from years ago 
and the kind of situations which repeat themselves time and time again from that period until now and probably for another 50 years. But within my practice, one of the things that I found a parallel with, with Jimmy's writing was also similar in traditions of old masks and masquerading was a, a sense of trying to find a new expression and to use exaltation and, and, and almost how to define a victory before we've entered a battle in a way in order to define who we can be and how we reach those triumphs. Um, I try to make my work uh, uh, to use a sense of celebration uh, uh, throughout my work, which kind of also marks a sense of victory in a way that I'm keen to accomplish. Um, I, I like the sense of jubilance that came from Jimmy in terms of who he was and, and how he pushed that on, onto the kids coming up. Um, and, and I thought it was interesting to posit those titles back onto abstract works that then lead to the questioning of, of Jimmy's writings and, and a reflection of how the time has passed since then and now and how people might look upon the journey or the plight of the situations that he was cast within and what really has transformed and what remains the same. Yeah. Since this is a conversation and dialogue, I think, you know, let's dialogue. Do you have any questions, thoughts, anything you'd like to ask for? You know? So, sorry, is that to me or to the audience? Okay, good. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? I have a question about the individual works um, that we're looking at here in the gallery. Um, I was wondering if there's any particular you want to talk about that, uh, that reveals some elements of uh, Baldwin's work. And Zach, before, I, you start, like, before you start, can I just ask you maybe to put your microphone a little closer to your mouth because you can hear you better when you're, you have the microphone on your uh, headphones. Okay, thank you. I, I think for me, the two works that would probably be the strongest in reference are No, Na um, uh, no Name in the Street and a Native Son. In particular, in the Native Son, I was trying to forget, project a sense of, if you like, the gaiety, the freedom, the frivolousness that Baldwin incited in his conversations. I guess to me in spirit, that feels closest uh, to, to, to a relationship with Jimmy in that sense. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when, when did you first uh, read Baldwin? Where's the person? Well, I missed the question then. For him, the first time was when he gave him his book. <laughs> <laughs> Before then, he didn't know as a writer. I just didn't know, didn't, didn't know him as a writer. What book was it? What book was it? The um, Chasse de la Lumière. Chasse de la Lumière. Chasse de la Lumière. I said on the street. Sometimes the translations in French are odd. Um, like uh, just above my head is actually uh, it's actually like uh, 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 Harlem Quartet in French. So it's like the, often the translations are very different. So it's whatever Chasse de la Lumière was. So it's chasing the light, but I don't know what the what the book was in. <laughs> So it wasn't novel, it was one of his uh, novels. Or is it, is he, he still has it. Oh. The same question? What was, the, what was your first fault in reading? What is your new first? I expect to find next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. 
Same yeah, definitely, and and still one of my favourite. Um, Zach, can you talk to us a little bit about your father's film and also Excuse me, about uh, my father's film. Yes, the, the one that he made at Oxford of Baldwin. Sorry, Baldwin's Neger. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think what had happened was Jimmy had planned this meeting, and Horace and his crew had decided that it was a great opportunity to document this moment, but. Uh, for me, what makes the film special in many ways is that he's speaking to a Caribbean and African audience in particular. And there's a pivot at a certain point where he describes himself as Negro and a Jamaican in the crowd asks him, why you call yourself a Negro? Why you don't call yourself a black man? And you can see Jimmy begins to sweat. And what's fascinating is suddenly he has to defend the, the difference of semantics and language uh, and the use of uh, African Americanisms, if you like, uh, and, and the history of that in, intolerance to an African and, and Caribbean crowd. What's fascinating to me is suddenly how that standoff uh, is, is, it becomes almost like two pugilists in the ring, it leads him to a really a, a incredible re recurring speech uh, to explain himself. And I think what's fascinating is, is, is in that moment, it's the meeting of two black cultures trying to assess what they share, their frustrations, the inequalities between Europe and the Americas. And it's a great meeting of minds. For me, it's, it's an important film in terms of how one can look at the situation that is happening in terms of uh, the black experience in Europe and Africa compared to the, the situation in Africa, I'm sorry, Af African America at that point in time. And, and compared by Dick Gregory and James Baldwin, it was, it was a very interesting uh, standoff, if you like, um, looking at how the two situations unfold. Was was Baldwin a guest teacher at the temple? Did I understand that correctly at the college there? In the occasional class. I'm just curious to know more about what he was like as a teacher. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I, know, I, know, I know what he was like as a passenger in my car. <laughs> 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 I, I don't know. I don't know what students said about him. I expect he was you heard him or if you didn't hear him in person lecture. You see him on screen, and he was himself in all situations. Yeah, definitely. Uh, provocative, uh, very, very articulate. Yeah. And uh, with no, no, no waste of words. You know. Yeah. Uh, very, 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 very precise. Those students were by and large Turkish. Um, and something was lost in translation in all of our classes with them. Um, so it's, it, it was at the time a college that was intended to indoctrinate uh, Turkish students and move them toward uh, Americanisms. Uh, C certainly, I'm sure he uh, said some things that were shocking um, at the time. The political climate there was very, very conservative, uh, and c certainly there was an awareness uh, about his sexual orientation uh, among the faculty uh, at the college. Um, and I, I, I certainly the faculty members <laughs> embraced him. Um, and it was a very, um, in terms of nationality, it was a very mixed faculty Americans, Turks, uh, Brits, uh, a few French. 
about how conversations with him influenced my writing. Uh, and the two things I remember most clearly when I was thinking about uh, moving from academic writing to, uh, to fiction, he told me to begin reviewing books of others. Uh, write reviews, he said. And writing reviews made me read differently. And that was one very useful uh, entree into creative writing. And the other thing he told me was, whenever you write a book review, include a reference to your own work. <laughs> uh, and if you look back at some of his uh, <laughs> he found a way of framing the review in terms of what he had been thinking about, what he had been thinking about. That in, insofar as my work has been influenced, I've tried to uh, think about that. And certainly reading his words uh, had me trying to get closer to uh, this closer to some political issues, I guess, in, in my own way. Question? One time, one time, I was talking about a um, party at the house. The last one or two, was it the birthday party when he was texting that? How he, how he was um, drawn to some of the moms in part for the creative energy of the people around him. That's the thing, I'm saying it. You know, people who came to, to share their their lives with him in a way that maybe they couldn't with others. They were, they were living in this world. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brother David. Yeah. Um, it was a rather sad occasion. And at the time, day seven, um, Jimmy's celebrity seemed to be on the decline. And he had invited some celebrities who didn't come. And at the end of the party, um, I think he felt let down and felt his own celebrity diminished in, in some way. Bobby Shaw, whom some of you don't even know the name of because you're too young. <laughs> 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 uh, was, I think, the, the most prominent figure. And the other people were village people, uh, people from Saint Paul de Vance, who were his friends. Uh, uh, de, uh, Bernard Kersel, uh, who was his uh, a caretaker, I guess. Uh, it was small. It was toward the end. Um, and I didn't know at the time just how near the end he was. There's somebody back there who's either adjusting his glasses or at least his hand. Yeah. <laughs> Zach, could you please maybe tell us more about those? 
those conversations that used to happen over when um, uh, Uncle Jimmy would visit you in the UK? Well, yeah, I mean, again, Jimmy was always extremely eloquent as a speaker. Um, it was a bit like Lee Morgan doing a trumpet solo. Uh, he had a way with words that he was quite incredible and musical in that sense, um, and quite profound often. Um, interestingly, in, in our home in Britain, often the backdrop were other men and women from the Caribbean, other writers uh, from, from the, the local scene in London. Um, often the politics was back and forth between what was happening on two sides of the coin. Um, but Jimmy had a way of, 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 of just pronouncing himself that seemed to sit above most people there um, and, 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 and was very generous in terms of the attention he gave, uh, especially to us as kids, but also to anyone he was delivering a speech to. Um, so, yeah, the conversations were always quite politically driven. Uh, they always kind of stemmed to be around either politics or art literature of the day. Um, and his perspective and insights on, on what was happening. Um, but always thrilling to listen to him as a child speak. Thank you. Um, James Ball's experience in Sarkeek was he happy there? Do you know why he left? Well, I used to uh, tease him a bit by saying he was there because nobody knew his name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he enjoyed a kind of anonymity there uh, that he didn't have in New York or elsewhere in the US. Yeah. It was free in a way. Uh, and to be uh, an expat uh, freed him a little bit insofar as we can be free of our sense of responsibility about the direction of the United States. Yeah. Uh, it freed him a little bit. It gave him distance on uh, US issues. I think he was happy there. Yeah, uh, he enjoyed the friendship of uh, the playwright or the, the theater, theatrical community there. Um, and uh, certainly the Americans there knew his name. And um, we knew that we were in the presence of genius and in the presence of somebody who was making an extraordinary contribution to American history. Yeah, completely. I stopped adjusting his glasses and he raised his hand. ahead hmm. and there's a, a hard road ahead. Do you think he was happy here? Is that all it No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think he would be happy. Do you think he was happy? He was happy here. Yeah. I think yes. Yeah. Yes, he, and he loved his house. Uh, and his friendship here. Yeah, he was happy. He couldn't be happy. Uh, what do you remember about the house and how he was in his space? Um, well, it was an architectural digest 
article about the house, uh, which did not look like the house uh, I found him in. <laughs> Uh, they did what Architectural Digest does, you know, and uh, they brought in plans. I don't, I don't know what they did. Uh, in any case, uh, it's it's a treasure, and um, well, you know about the, the situation, and perhaps uh, want to add something. Sorry. Want to add something about it? Oh, about no, yes. it's so. Uh, it could be a monument. But before the impression being invested in the East and what did you see I heard the first part of that impression when I read it. Well, one, I was very sad at the act. Huh? Uh, I don't recall. I, I found the characterizations uh, credible, authentic. Uh, I think I only had praise for the work. And most of all, uh, just the, the chance to see his manuscript, you know, to touch it. Uh, felt very, very sacred. And I was grateful. Uh, excuse me, Paul, I guess you did the article. The question was, does he talk about his neighbors? Yeah, yeah but. but... <laughs> 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 in the beginning, he presented himself at the gallery. So, in the beginning, he presented himself at the gallery. Personnellement, je ne connaissais pas. Personally, he didn't really know Alors, at the beginning. On a sympathisé. So we got to know each other. On a échangé. Little by little. Dans le village. He became a part of the village. As a writer. From the life he had, the life he had, the way that he became a leader. Et les gens ont tout de suite leur amis vraiment comme un frère. And everybody almost immediately accepted him as a brother. Parce qu'il avait débordé de sympathie. Because he was so sympathetic to other people. Toujours quand je souvenir qu'il avait toujours le sourire. He was always smiling. Il a donné de l'amour. Always gave his love. C'était généreux. He was generous. Et les gens l'ont adopté. Et voilà. Zach, pouvez-vous me raconter la histoire de Uncle Jimmy? Oui, je veux dire, très. Très sweetly, quand la production de théâtre a eu lieu à Londres, j'ai escorté à l'entrée, ce qui était fantastique. Juste être dans le milieu, un peu comme la merveille, si vous voulez, que a créé dans le spectacle, pour le voir arriver, pour le voir la performance de son livre. Et le spectacle était fantastique. Le monde était vraiment ému. Il a créé un spectacle qui buzz in the theatre was second to none. Uh, and still stands out today to watch uh, a full stage of actors performing to the writer um, that inspired their work. Um, within that moment, he never ever refrained with his generosity to me as a child. His hand was always extended and we were close. Um, how he carried so many situations at the same time was always a marvel to me, but it was due to his generosity of nature and you know the kind of individual that he was.
small he was, uh, alone he was, and I felt like, you know, I was so sorry, and probably to this minute I'm sorry that I couldn't say something other than look like a silly, you know, awestruck person because he was engaging. I mean, if I had been able to say something, I could have probably been able to sit down. So that's my story. Thank you. Who else has a story? 
Jimmy, second or third thing? Yeah. The second half story. Um, where should I look? <laughs> Okay, it feels weird because it's not my story, but <laughs> it's my friend Anne Bailey's story. We were at Harvard together, and she was the um, president of the Association of Black Radford Women, Black Women. And uh, Jimmy was coming to town, or he was coming to give a lecture at Harvard, and then he was going to have a dinner in what they called the master's houses. So the dorms were, they had a master and a mistress who were in charge, and they were people who lived there, and they would throw parties for us. And so she got an engraved invitation to come to the reception. And we were all really excited for her. And so, you know, she got her hair done, she got her nails, she bought an outfit. Um, we were like waiting by the phone to tell us how it was. And she showed up at the master's house and they opened the door and they said the kitchen's that way. And they handed her an apron. And, and she was standing in the doorway and he saw from where he was sitting and he said, oh, there's my guest. And he went and he got her and he and he got a table and he sat her next to him the entire time. exhibition of photographs of Jimmy, an exhibition in Boston, the photographer, a Paris-based photographer named Carlos Friere. And um, it was a, an exhibition that involved conversations about his image and how he felt about his image. And that took me to um, his obituary. Uh, one day taking liberty of reading just a paragraph. Um, what I said at that event. In the New York Times obituary of James Baldwin, Lee Daniels wrote, soft-spoken and physically slight, he thought of himself for many years as ugly and wrote poignantly of his struggle to accept the way he looked. That's a quote, close quote. In his biography, David Leamy relates an incident that may have been a defining moment in the development of Baldwin's self image. Quote, an enduring and ever present memory was his, of his stepfather's making fun of his eyes and calling him the ugliest child he had ever seen. 
to the end of his life, Baldwin told of an incident related to that memory, an incident that he felt had affected the course of his life. In the streets one day, when he was perhaps five or six, he was astounded by the sight of an old drunken woman with huge eyes and lips. He rushed upstairs and called his mother to the window. You see, you see, he said, she's uglier than you, mama. She's uglier than me. Oh, wow. Now I went on to add, uh, no matter what James Baldwin said or wrote about this image, the brilliant contributions of his body of work deserve the force of his personality, the gleaming clarity of his integrity, render him and his image pleasing, appealing, captivating, compelling, handsome, indeed very beautiful are the photographs that we have. Oh, maybe we can hear Zach still. Zach, we cannot see you. Yeah. Um, we can't see you. Okay, hold on. Let's just end up the final final comments of that any of the one question. Yeah, for final explanation. Zach, do you have any thoughts on uh, this relationship and where it's, where it's brought to you in the 30s? Sorry, I'm struggling to hear you properly. Okay, closer to the microphone. Um, yeah. Can you leave us with some final thoughts about um, James Baldwin and his the relationship you had with him and how he influenced you as an artist? Um, yeah, sure. I, I, I think for me, the thing I try and take from, from Jimmy is a sense of how to be bigger, how, how to break ground, how to not be confined by other people's restrictions, how to really emancipate oneself in a way that isn't defined by another social group or, or, or the stigma of another social setting. Um, uh, within all the complexities that were and are Jimmy in that sense, I think what was outstanding was his selflessness uh, and, and, and his, his sense of size um, and stature because of that. What I tried to take from that is, is always to exalt, or always to see victory in, in any uh, obstacles that stand in front of me, and always to try and find a creative way through those moments. I think also Jimmy's sense of resolve in his nature, in who he was, in, in how he was able to understand the dilemmas and empathize uh, are, are crucial also. His sense of empathy along with his sense of understanding are really what, for me, make him a giant. Um, and I try to use that sense of his defiance, a sense of his strength as a building block for me to stand on. Thank you.